just so you guys do know, I am a consultant for the company that makes this product. So everyone's aware that I do have a role with the company. I've had a role in the development of the product and what have you. So, um, but we're going to talk about nasal valve collapse, and uh, we'll look about we'll look at some of the uh, issues in in uh, um, who should be selected for consideration for uh, these devices, and look at the technique as well. Um, can you run that video for me? Uh, so, you know, uh, I, I showed you one of my CT pictures the other day, and you can see I've got a little sinusitis. I also have some septal deviation, turbinate hypertrophy, um, some allergy, uh, some polypoid change in my turbinate. But you'll also notice I have a little bit of valve collapse. Go figure. I'm like a, just a little, you know, cauldron of all rhinologic diagnoses here, you know. Uh, yeah, so I have a little upper upper uh, uh, lateral uh, cartilage collapse there, and it is getting personal. So you know, this is uh, this a patient brought this in for me. <laughs> this is true. He, actually, he didn't bring this in. He emailed me. He said, "I drew a picture for you to show you where my problem is," and that's where his problem is, right there. He's uh, and. And he wasn't trying to be funny. That's the bad part. <laughs> I looked at it and I thought it was kind of funny. But uh, yeah, so that is kind of the area that uh, we're dealing with. And, and it's, uh, it's probably uh, not a bad representation of it. We certainly don't want this to happen, right? Chris's nose is falling off. Look at that. That's terrible. That's what happens to you when Chris's nose falls off if you're the person who did it. So... Uh, we need, we need something uh, that we can do that's uh, fairly fast, fairly simple, uh, and with very little complication risk. So just to remind you, the internal nasal valve uh, really is formed by the upper lateral cartilage and the head of the inferior turbine. It is in the narrowest point of the nasal airway. External valve is really down over the ala and the lower lateral cartilage. And, you know, it's important to consider uh, both static narrowing as well as dynamic collapse. Both can be important and uh, what you uh, choose to do to the valve uh, will differ depending on what you see. Um, and I just throw up the, the, the equations that you know now immediately after lunch make your eyes roll back in your head. But just to remember that uh, there's a significant change in airflow with a, a slight change in the radius of the opening substantial change in airflow. And similarly, uh, when you're talking about uh, uh, resistance, there's a marked increase in resistance when there's a similar change in that radius as well. So just to be aware that small changes can make huge, huge impact for our patients. And then of course with the uh, uh, dynamic valve obstruction, you get that Venturi effect, that Bernoulli's principle, where you get that drawing of the, of the uh, tissues in as the airflow is going by. All right, so what I do for my patients when I'm trying to assess uh, for uh, doing some valve reconstruction, I really have come to rely on the modified caudal maneuver. And it's very simple, uh, as opposed to a caudal where you're actually putting your finger on the outside of the nose here, kind of dra dragging the face over. Um, I, I just uh, put a little curette, uh, a little uh, ear curette into the nasal cavity, and I just put a little gentle pressure up on the upper lateral cartilage. That's generally where I'm going to push the pressure, put a little pressure. And if patients note some significant benefit with that, then I'm willing to consider doing something for them. What I have found is that um, I will do uh, septoplasty on a patient, and when I've straightened the septum, sometimes you'll unmask a little valve collapse that you didn't appreciate initially. It's almost like the crooked septum was kind of stenting the valve originally. And so I'm finding this in some of my uh, post-op septoplasty patients that we're seeing some of this collapse occur. And uh, doing a modified caudal can help you to see that a little more readily. Now, obviously, there's a lot of treatments for valve uh, collapse, and, and obviously, we're going to recommend that patients try some of the non-surgical treatments initially. One of the things I found also is if a patient comes in and says they've been using Breathe Right strips or they use these nasal cones or something like that, and they do feel that they're beneficial, I think they're good candidates, potentially good candidates, and they have valve reconstruction. 
So this is the problem, though, for me as a rhinologist. I look at that and I say, ooh, that looks scary. And it is scary because there's a lot of different very valid surgical procedures that have been described for dealing with the nasal valve. And, and uh, they, they vary from fairly simple to fairly complex. And uh, the truth is, is that I don't know that I really want to get involved with those as a rhinologist anyway. And I tell people that I kind of avoid these procedures just like I avoid uh, being this guy, doing a little cleaning on the statue there. So um, this, is, this is what we've come, kind of developed as an alternative uh, to the, the other procedures that are out there. This is the uh, uh, Latera implant. It is a minimally invasive procedure. And that's the application device right there. It's a 16-gauge needle, essentially, is what it is. And the uh, little implant is placed into the lateral nasal wall. Um, and it provides just a little bit of uh, strength to the lateral wall and also prevents some of that dynamic collapse. And I say that it's even so easy that a rhinologist like Greg can even do it. <laughs> so this is, uh, can you run this a little video? This is just a little schematic uh, video that kind of shows how the implant is placed. Um, the implant is made up of uh, polylactic acid. It's a copolymer, 70-30 mix. So it's the same material that's used in our resorbable uh, uh, plates that we use for maxillofacial reconstruction and uh, trauma. So it's a, you put a little puncture in the, uh, almost like a marginal kind of location uh, over the ala there. And you uh, uh, are staying in the um, supraperichondrial, supraperiosteal layer sort of underneath that fat layer, super smass kind of layer there. And the, the implant is then in, engages the periosteum up at the top there, extends out about four millimeters or so beyond the tip of your little um, uh, needle injector there. And that's really it. The implant stays in place about 18 months in most of the studies that have been done. Uh, it's possible, obviously, in, in some cases, it's going to resorb quicker, in some cases, longer. But the deal is, is that it will, uh, or the hope anyway, is that it will create a little bit of scar tissue as it resorbs and then give a little bit of persistence to that strength in that lateral wall. So um, we have 12-month uh, outcomes now um, on the first uh, uh, 56 implants and 30 patients. This, this study was actually done in Germany. Uh, the initial study was done in Germany. So the pre-op nose score, 76.7, that's very obstructed. That's a good high level of obstruction. Uh, and then the post-op nose score at six months was 33.3. So about a 50% improvement, a little over 50% improvement for, the, for the, uh, all the patients that were studied. No cosmetic change. That's an important thing. A lot of patients ask about that. We don't see any uh, cosmetic issues with this. Now, we do just have uh, now recently the 12-month data, and you'll see the 12-month data is actually mirroring what we saw at six months. That's really encouraging that we're getting a little bit of legs to the, uh, the procedure, at least a year or so where patients are seeming like they're getting some good benefit from it. And that's it. And I'm a minute, a minute ahead of schedule. That's great. <laughs>